Okay, everybody, uh, we're going to start the presentation now. Um, this is Rob Packard from Medical Device Academy. Uh, this training is on pre-subs. Uh, I've done a, another webinar in the past on pre-submissions, but I haven't done one since they made an update to the pre-submission guidance document in September of last year, 2017. So this has some updated items in there, but it also reflects some of the questions that people asked when they registered for this webinar. So there's some new content in here. The other thing that's quite different about this particular webinar is that my opinions and experience on doing pre-subs have dramatically changed in the last 18 months. In the past, I had done maybe, a, maybe about a dozen pre-sub meetings over the, my career. I've done as many as three in a week. Um, in 2018. So uh, we do a lot of precepts now. And I, in the past, I actually made the statement, you know, if, if you really already have a special controls guidance document, or you have already done a submission of this device type, and you're an experienced regulatory professional, you probably really don't need a precept. And I regretted those words, because um, the, the FDA made a couple of changes. Um, one of them was to the biomedical, um, sorry, the biocompatibility guidance document that, that the FDA had provided. Uh, they released that in 2016. And then there was another one that they released on uh, around the same time on uh, human factors. And those two guidance documents made a significant impact on what I, uh, what my opinions were in the number of uh, questions that clients would run into with the FDA and have to respond to requests for additional information. And as a result, I always recommend doing a pre-sub now, even if we're 100% sure, and I'm encouraging clients to do the pre-subs much earlier than I used to encourage them to do these pre-subs. Um, you know, just check, check. Okay, so yes, they're just asking questions. Nobody's saying they can't hear. Good. So um, one of the big things here is I always recommend doing a pre-sub for all my clients now. I've even made it uh, more affordable. I've lowered my pricing that I charge. I used to charge between two and four thousand dollars for pre-sub preparation. Now I just charge a flat fee of two thousand dollars for pre-sub preparation, and I knock a thousand dollars off of the five ten k preparation itself just to encourage my clients, look, it's only costing you net an extra thousand dollars to do a pre-sub, but it's so valuable to you. And I'll go through some of the reasons why I feel it's more valuable, but it really helps you to do a pre-sub. Um, and I'll go through the different reasons, but you can ask more, but um, I have found zero benefits to not doing a pre-sub. Um, people talk about the waste of time. You know, we don't have time to do this. But I think by the end of the session, you'll see why you can't afford not to do a pre-sub. Um, first of all, the origin, sort of the history of where pre-subs came from. I'm, my history dates back to 2000 um, in the medical device field. And before that, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. So my experience working with FDA regulators is a little bit more lengthy than, than some people. But... They were doing pre-subs all along, but it was somebody informally picking up the phone or emailing somebody at the FDA that was a reviewer and asking them to answer some questions. And maybe they had a personal relationship with them. Maybe it was a professional one. Maybe they uh, knew them from a previous submission that they have done. But they were asking questions unofficially or officially, and, and they were helping uh, the FDA understand what they were planning on doing in the future, as well as making sure they had everything thing that the FDA wanted in the order that they wanted for their next submission. But we didn't call them precepts, we just called them teleconferences or calls. I'm gonna call the FDA and, and, and get their opinion on this before we do a submission. So it was very unofficial. And then they started doing pre-IDE meetings for the, the investigational device exemptions. Whenever you do a clinical study for a significant risk device, they would have IDE meetings. And, um, they're only, call, they're only IDEs if you have to get approval for a significant risk. If you have a non-significant risk device, like a Band-Aid, you're not going to do a pre, uh, not going to do an investigational device exemption approval from the FDA to do that study. It's only the significant risk devices that require that IDE. It's a formal submission that has to be provided to the FDA in a special format. It's expensive and time-consuming to prepare those. 
So if you don't need them, you don't submit them. But if you are going to all go through all that trouble, you would want to have a pre-IDE meeting with the FDA to discuss your clinical study. Well, now as time has gone along and the budget restrictions on the FDA have become more and more stringent, uh, now that in order to keep track of their time and make sure that they allocate enough time for each submission in a very fair and even way, now they have a formal process for requesting time of the reviewer and getting their opinions before you do submissions. And so it's not just limited to pre-IDE meetings now, it's all kinds of meetings where you want to ask a question. They call them pre-subs and you put in these meeting requests and they assign a queue number whenever you, they receive your request and they schedule a date in the future. So that's where the pre-sub concept came from and how it sort of morphed into what it is today. Here's a brief agenda of what we're going to cover today, but um, I'll go ahead and move on rather than reading the slides for you. So what is the pre-sub meeting? It's just a meeting with the FDA to discuss um, what questions you have about your submission. And it can be for a 510K, it can be for a de novo application, it can be for an IDE, or it can be for a PMA. And those are just the device one. Um, and you can have more than one pre-sub meeting for the same submission. So you could ask a preliminary one and when you're very early on in your um, development process and then later on you could have another one that's much later in the development process where you're asking people for more information um, about the maybe specific testing uh, decisions you make in the uh, verification and validation testing. There are actually some guidance documents here. So um, I don't remember whether I updated this link here for uh, the most recent guidance, but I believe it's on the last slide. This is the pre-sub meeting guidance. And as we go through, I sort of show the history of the guidance document. The original draft was in 2012. We did a final one in 2014, and then they updated in 2017. And uh, this in precedes that blue book memo that we had for pre id as I said, originally these were pre-IDE meetings that sort of morphed into something that was much broader and covered other types of submissions other than IDEs. And uh, you'll get a native slide deck with these if you haven't already, so you can uh, have an easier time of getting those uh, hyperlinks. So in 2017, they issued this new uh, guidance, but fundamentally the pre-sub process didn't change in 2017. The key things that changed in 2017 were related to timing. And if you remember, if any of you have been working on submissions recently, October 1st is the beginning of the fiscal year for the FDA. And in, at the end of 2016, the industry and the FDA negotiated new pricing under MADUFMA 4. And the, the whole goal of this increasing of fees was to give the FDA additional funding so they could put more resources to bear on getting faster timing and turnaround for decisions, specifically on 510Ks and other types of meetings like pre-subs. So now instead of waiting up to 90 days or more for the FDA to schedule a pre-sub meeting, now they have very specific timelines for when they're supposed to be conducting these meetings, and they're supposed to be between 60 and 75 days. And uh, the FDA is supposed to be giving you a written response to every pre-sub request. You ask a bunch of questions in your pre-sub, they're supposed to give you an email response within 70 days or at least five days before your pre-sub is scheduled, whichever comes first. So you, you kind of want to expect to see the FDA scheduled in these meetings somewhere in the 60 to 75 days. And typically I'll, I'll try to pick dates that are around 70 days and put those actually in my pre-sub request for these are the dates we'd like to have a meeting to sort of um, guide the FDA in the direction of these are the dates we'd like to have and it meets your guidelines. But you can download that guidance and that's the key change that they've made is that now they've said these are the timelines that are in effect for uh, FDA's targets to comply with the pre-sub uh, guidance program. And as I said before, it started out as IDEs uh, pre-submission meetings, but now it's been expanded to other types, such as de novos and 510Ks. 
you might even be reviewing a draft special controls guidance document um, because if you're preparing a de novo application, you might be talking with the FDA about what testing would be required for your company, but that's also going to impact future companies who also have to do the same testing. So there might be a discussion of that, or you might be talking with the FDA about, hey, there isn't a special controls guidance for this type of device that's already on the market, and we've done some of these submissions, and we wanted to comment on the draft. Um, they also could be, they, these also are all going to be tracked as what they call queue submissions. And they'll actually have a queue number. Um, the queue precedes the number, whatever the meeting is. So when they send an acknowledgement, we've received it, they're also going to give you that queue number. And that hyperlink that explains these meetings is provided down below here. CDRH Learn is a, is a web page on the FDA website that has a whole bunch of different training that they offer. You can watch his webinars on a variety of topics, including clinical studies and facts and case missions. So, as I said before, the timing of the pre-subs, they're targeting between 60 and 75 days for scheduling the meeting from the date they receive your request. And there should be a written response to all your questions in the pre-sub uh, at 70 days or five days prior to your meeting. So if you schedule it at 68 days, you would hope to have a written response on day 63 whichever comes sooner. And these are calendar days. However, sometimes because of the complexity of the questions you're asking or the device is so different from anything else they've seen or it involves clinical study data that they need time to review, in these cases, the FDA may ask for more time. So this is their target, but they don't, there's nothing you can do if they ask for more time. It's just they're targeting as part of meeting a congressional mandate Targeting trying to hit these 60 to 75 days on average for submissions. And if yours is going to take longer, it's going to take longer. If it happens to fall around the holidays, it's probably going to get pushed after the holidays. But if you catch them at a time of year when it's not holidays and you have a fairly straightforward set of questions that don't require a lot of people to give feedback and those people aren't out of the office, then you'll probably get your meeting in 60 to 75 days. And I've had a lot of success getting most of them even inside of 70 days. So when do you have a pre-sub? This was a very common session. Everybody's worried about the timing of when they should have a pre-sub. In general, almost all my clients do it later than I would like. I would like them to schedule them earlier, earlier in the design process. They involve me later in the design process than they probably should, and they request the pre-subs much too late in the process, often right before they're ready, getting ready to submit. And oftentimes I hear the statement from them, well, what's the point in submitting? We're almost ready to submit the 510K. And so my recommendation for the timing of when a pre-sub pre should be is sometime between when you approve your design inputs and when you approve your design output. During that development cycle where it's probably an iterative process and you're making changes rapidly to the device design and maybe trying them out either in cadaver labs or trying them out in animal studies or trying them out on bench tests and you're seeing what works and what doesn't work, this is a great time to be having discussions with the FDAs about what testing will be required so you can maybe do some preliminary screening against the different tests to see what, what is it going to have trouble passing and what is going to be pretty easy. Quotes and plan that, that testing. But it's never too late to ask for a pre-sub meeting because oftentimes the testing takes a little longer than you think it's going to be. So even though you think you're going to submit the 510K next month, so what's the point in asking for a pre-sub that's going to take two months to schedule? And then you find out, oops, it's going to be four more weeks or six more weeks before we actually submit because we had a problem in the testing. And it, the report's going to be delayed. Or the molded parts were incorrect and they had to redo the mold. There's all kinds of reasons why projects slip. And because they often slip four, five, six, eight weeks, when you say you don't have enough time, reality is you probably do. Always cancel the meeting. So if you schedule the meeting and then you find everything came in on time and we are ready to submit, then you can cancel it. The FDA won't penalize you for that. Um, just be polite and say, sorry, we're ready to submit the 510K, so we're going to go ahead and submit, and no need for the pre-submit anymore off their schedule.
For a lot of people out there, um, they don't really have a full understanding of the design process of all the pieces that interact. And the busyness of this slide explains why. Uh, the two humps that are in there, the first hump is research. The second hump is development. And those two processes overlap. But in theory, the way it's supposed to work is you come up with an idea for a product, and that's in the concept phase, and that's when you create your design plan and your risk management plan. And when you approve that plan is when you're supposed to start your DHF. What do most companies do? They wait until they're almost ready to start their verification and validation testing, and that's when they start their DHF. So there's a lot of work that has to be retroactively documented. Is that bad? No. It's just less than ideal. That means you get some retroactive work to document. And retroactive documentation is always a little bit more challenging than if you had done it while you were doing it. It's always easier to document while you're in the activity and after the fact. During the feasibility stage, we're just trying to come up with some, some basic prototypes to, to prove the concept. And this is when you're gonna identify some hazards. You're gonna research other products that are on the market that are similar. You're gonna identify how those fail. You're gonna look at the TPLC database. You're gonna look at uh, different standards. And you're gonna come up with a list of design inputs. Design inputs are not preliminary design inputs. A lot of engineers think it is, but they're wrong. What design inputs are is these are the things that I have to pass as tests. So they're a list of standards, they're a list of requirements. So when I say uh, a device needs a certain power output to light a light bulb, for instance, let's say it's an LED or a display, it has to have a certain power and current. Uh, so it, it, needs, uh, it needs to pass a test for what this circuit is going to deliver in terms of power to the display. But that doesn't mean that my design input is it must be a AA battery or a lithium ion battery or some other type of rechargeable battery or non-rechargeable battery. Those are design outputs. It has, when I test the power circuit, it has to deliver a certain amount of power to make the display work properly. And if it doesn't have that amount, it's not gonna work at all. And oftentimes I want more than that so it doesn't kill the battery life prematurely when you have the charge and discharge cycle. So I might actually specify I want to have at least uh, this much cushion in the battery power so it won't negatively affect the charge and discharge cycle on rechargeable batteries. Well, I can test that with an amp meter, so I can design a protocol for testing that. That's the verification test I'm going to design. So my design inputs are the requirements for the test, the acceptance criteria, tells me what test I'm going to use, what device I'm going to use to measure. Um, it tells me how many samples I'm going to run, but it doesn't tell me what the design is going to be. The design is going to be a design output. So what battery I use, what brand I use, who I buy it from, what size it is, what shape it is, what color it is, all those are design outputs. Don't get the two confused. The time to ask for the pre-sub meeting is right after I've finalized all those tests but before I know what the final design of the device is gonna look like. So that's oftentimes why you need more than one pre-sub because you're asking initially to make sure, do I have the right tests listed that I'm gonna to have to pass for this device? And maybe the predicate I've identified is appropriate and the, the regulatory pathway is appropriate. Then I might have another pre-sub later in the process where I'm asking more specific questions that are related to the design of the device because I've gotten much further. So if I have like an 18 month design process, this development phase uh, might be long enough that it makes sense to have two pre-subs in here. But if I have a short uh, development process, then there might only be time for one design in here. If I'm making a minor modification to a device, I still might wanna do the pre-sub, but I'm, I'm gonna probably do it at the very beginning of the project in this feasibility phase might only be weeks. So I might go very quickly from the approval of the project to design inputs, have my pre-sub, and be almost ready to start verification the instant I get the response from the FDA and have that meeting. So that sort of gives you an idea of the timeline that we're talking about here. But it vary a lot based on the project. You can also have uh, supplements to these meetings. So you might have your meeting scheduled, then submit your meeting minutes, and then submit a supplement to the meeting. So there might be another 60 days of reviewing uh, meeting minutes and supplements that occur after the pre-sub meeting. 
Is the pre-sub meeting required? Everybody asks this because they hear so much about pre-subs and they, and they don't know whether it's required or whether they should do it or shouldn't do it. No, it's not required. But they're in, you get invaluable information in this meeting. So why wouldn't you do it? Oh, by the way, it's free. The only thing you have to do is prepare it. And most of the content you prepare, you're going to put in the 510K anyway. So why wouldn't you do a pre-sub meeting? Because you've never done one before, so it's new to you, so it's big and scary. So that's why you're taking this webinar, to make it not so big and scary. So the logistics. Um, I have redlined something here. It says one hard copy. Unofficially, just a few weeks ago, the FDA announced when they had that government shutdown for a whole day, they announced that no longer would you have to submit a full hard copy of your submission whenever you submit. That's both 510Ks, de novos, and pre-subs. You only have to submit a hard copy of the cover, of the cover letter and the e-copy. So if you're using a flash drive or a CD, you'd submit that plus the cover letter. If you have a two-page cover letter, like most of mine are, or sometimes even one for pre-subs, you're submitting one or two pages of paper plus an e-copy. You don't need a binder anymore. You don't need to pay me for hundreds or thousands of pages of printing. So I've got a really big expensive printer now that doesn't get a lot of use, but that's okay. I, I got it to help my own self out when I had to do a lot of these pre-subs in 510Ks with a hard copy. So now we don't need hard copies. If you want a hard copy, I'm more than happy to print you one. But the FDA only needs your cover letter now. And that's unofficial. I'm waiting for the new e-copy guidance to come out. They were planning one anyway, and I think it's delayed in coming out because then it's policy change. Um, I've already submitted some without the hard copy, just the cover letter, and haven't had any pushback or complaints or saying we didn't provide a copy. So... I know it's true, even though it was unofficial, but um, I've been able to verify it through a couple other sources. So you no longer have to pr print the whole thing, just the cover letter. <laughs> um, and if you're wondering what I charge for that, if you just want to print the cover letter and print out the, and prepare the e-copy, um, that including the FedEx, I only charge a flat fee of 150 bucks. So my prices have come down too. This is where you send the pre -sub. So whether it's a, whether it's a pre-sub or a 510K or meeting minutes, it always goes to the document center. Document control center, and this is the exact address, and you should have it in your uh, FedEx uh, favorites if you have a FedEx account. Um, this is what has to be in the cover letter. I have a little bit more information on the following page, but identify the submission as a pre-sub meeting request instead of a 510K request or a submission. Um, who is the sponsor contact? Don't get confused between the sponsor contact and the consultant that is working for you. You don't have to have everything go to the consultant. You can just make it clear in the letter, this is the sponsor, and then at the end, this is who I want the stuff to go to if it's a consultant. And then the device name is important and um, the information specific to the Q type. It should be Q subtype. Here's the general timeline for the whole process. Uh, this hasn't really changed except for when they provide feedback down here. So the RTA process is 15 days is their deadline for responding to your RTA. I haven't seen one take that long. Is the, uh, the checklist for the precepts is so much shorter than a 510K RTA. Uh, but they make sure that your, your submission of a precept meets all the requirements and it's complete. Then the contact, the, the submitter contact will um, contact you and ask you to schedule a date with them. Um, that doesn't happen right away. It, it'll happen in theory sometime between 15 and 21 days, but I've seen it take quite a bit longer. Um, and they'll ask you to submit an agenda for the meeting. That doesn't need to be submitted up until right before the meeting, but the earlier you submit it, the more helpful it is to them to make sure that you're covering everything in the meeting. Um, sometimes I like to wait until I get that feedback from the FDA five days prior to the meeting, and then I give them the meeting minutes, because if they answered most of my questions, it'll be a shorter meeting, and I can tell them what things I have clarification questions on. I might even cancel the meeting. If they answered every question I had, and it was to my satisfaction, I don't have any further questions, go ahead and cancel the meeting. But if there's something that I want to cover that's, that's not quite clear to me, or I want to ask a follow-up question on, um, I asked 10 questions, they answered nine of them, and one I want to follow up on. I'll say questions one through nine, I don't have any further questions, but I still want to have the meeting, because when I ask this one question, I only need this one person to address it. So you might have a biocompatibility question, that one person needs to be there, the others don't need to be. 
This could be a very short meeting with zero people there. That helps out the FDA. Um, and then the FDA is supposed to schedule a meeting for 60 to 75 days out from the date of uh, your request. And the sponsor is supposed to provide draft meeting minutes to the document control center within 15 calendar days of your actual meeting. So if you had the meeting on day 60, at day 75, you would submit your draft meeting minutes or earlier. I usually a day or two of the actual meeting. So if I have my meeting on day 76, day 77 is usually when the meeting minutes are going out. The FDA reviews and edits your draft meeting minutes. They have 30 days to do that, but they often don't take that long. And um, they'll confirm that everything looks okay, or they'll ask you to make changes. And you're allowed to provide a courtesy copy to the reviewer when you actually submit your 510K of your pre-sub meeting minutes. So let's say four or five, six page document that you created for meeting minutes, you can actually include that as part of your cover letter uh, section in your, in your uh, 510K to remind the reviewer or tell the new reviewer that's been assigned to your 510K of what's already been uh, discussed with the FDA previously. You also have to mention this Q number for your submission <coughs> in your uh, 510K as a previous discussion you have with the agency. Okay, the basics of what is a pre-sub. Uh, the whole purpose of it is to provide several options. I'm sorry. Um, the whole the whole basis of the meeting is to have an opportunity to ask the FDA questions. That's the purpose of the whole meeting. Um, they provide several options for dates um, to remain flexible. The um, you want to when you request your meeting in the last document that they request, they're asking you how what days what times would be good for your meeting. And typically, I'll provide three days that are between 70 and 75 days. So maybe one on day 71, one on day 72, one on day 73. And there, I might not be available all those times, so I'll suggest some time slots on those three different days to give the FDA some options. If none of those work for the FDA, maybe your submission uh, re involves a specialist like a, a plastic surgeon needs to be present to discuss uh, clinical data that you're going to submit then that person might only be available to the FDA on Tuesday, so you need to schedule it on Tuesday. If you don't know that, the FDA does, so they'll say, um, how about the following Tuesday? Will that work? Uh, the agenda should be um, according to the FDA, where you spend about a third of your time presenting the device. And then the balance of the time should be spent asking your questions and leave about 10 minutes at the end for uh, action items for the meeting. I recommend spending only about five minutes or maximum 10, but more like five minutes presenting your device. Why? You've already submitted a complete device description to the FDA. If you have a video of your device, submit the MP4 file format as part of your pre-sub. You, they don't want to get it as part of the meeting. They really want it ahead of time so they have time to review it. So submit your MP4 files, submit your device description, submit pictures and drawings of the device ahead of time so they see what the device looks like. Don't worry about whether it's final or not. They understand this is a pre-sub, so it might change. And you can even indicate during the pre-sub what things might change. Um, you might even see in the device description, we're comparing a couple of different options and we haven't finalized which one but don't spend your whole time trying to impress the FDA with how great your device is. They're not investors. They're there to answer your questions, not to be impressed. You wanna give very clear and concise background on your company. So the very beginning, here's who's present to the meeting, here's their titles, that shouldn't take more than two minutes, and then make sure they've got the information that you've sent them and start with a very brief device description of a couple of minutes and you're done. Five minutes, you're all ready to get into the questions. If the FDA has already answered some of your questions, say we have no further questions about item number one, two, three, four, let's jump to number five. If you are discussing a clinical study, you might want to provide them with a clinical synopsis and then get into some of the discussions about different uh, designs of a clinical study so you can submit to the FDA later as part of a supplement to the pre-sub a final clinical study protocol for them to review. And a lot more submissions are requiring clinical data in order to make the claims the companies want to make and to justify the safety and efficacy 
of the changes they've made to the technology of the device. So here's the general content that you have to have in your pre-sub, a cover letter. That's the thing that you're gonna print. Uh, and they actually have a template for a cover letter, but I gave you all my templates. So if you're looking for a cover letter template, just use mine. It's free, use it. Use it, put your name on it. You don't have to have my name on it. You should have your name on it. Uh, the table of contents, I provide you a table of contents template, a device description. Um, I would definitely use the device description template because it's designed for a 510K submission to meet all the requirements of a traditional RTA checklist. So if you cover everything on that list, you'll meet that you'll pass the RTA screening for the device description. And if you have any problems with the device description, maybe the FDA will point that out during the pre-sub. So I try to, that's one of the most important documents for a client to, to work on before they submit the pre-sub. And if there's something you don't have the information on yet, try to decide, is this really needed to answer the questions I have for the pre-sub, or is it something that you know, we're considering these two design options. Let's get input from the FDA on both possible ones. But then the final device description, uh, okay, we'll only have one of those two. They're okay with that. Um, the proposed indications and intended use, because that drives the, the second question in the fact and case, substantial equivalence thinking, and it's critical that the indications are almost identical to the predicate, that really has to not change. Whatever you're picking as indications, um, you really want to make sure that's as close to the predicate as possible if you're doing a 510K. If you're doing a de novo device, then you're creating a whole new device classification and you choose your own indications. But it, this is a great opportunity to discuss indications with the FDA and you may find what you thought was okay for indications is not okay with the FDA. The, for a 510K submission, they are very picky about what it should be worth. And I'll often ask you to make changes to the indications during the submission. That's important. That's pretty close to final when you submit. Then you get into uh, previous discussions and submissions. If there are none, there are none. So there's not much to that. But if you did a previous 510K and this is a pre-sub for a device modification, that's an important thing to spell out. Here was our previous 510K and it's been issued. And this is a device modification. Overview of product development. We're not looking for a book here. A single page will do often a paragraph is sufficient. But you, you might explain that it's being outsourced. You might say what stage of development you're at. You might say how much longer you have before you're ready to submit it. But they're just looking for an overview here, not detailed. Tell the company, tell the FDA about all your wonderful things that you can do. That's not what a Just trying to get a rough idea of where you are in the development cycle and how close you are to submitting is more the purpose of this. Then you get into the most important part of the entire submission is your questions. If you don't have questions, don't submit a pre-sub. And then at the very end, the last document is method of feedback. So in-person meeting, a teleconference, or an email. You could also have a fax, but some people don't even have fax machines anymore. So usually it's, an, it's either a teleconference or an in-person meeting. If I only had a single question, email would be fine. But keep in mind, the FDA is going to give you email feedback in writing five days before the teleconference or face-to-face -face meeting either way. So 99% of the time I'm advising clients do a teleconference and then five days before you're going to get an email and you have the option of canceling the teleconference if they answered all your questions. We'll get into, I know everybody wants to ask the benefits and disadvantages of in-person versus teleconference in. CEOs, for some reason, believe it's so critical to be in face-to-face -face in front of the FDA. I, I would like to dispel that, but I'll wait because I think I already have another slide that covers that. I'll make sure I cover that, and I know I probably already have five questions in the queue asking about. Okay, table of contents. This is an actual snapshot of not a real table of contents, but I took my template that I already gave you, and I color-coded it the way I normally do for projects, and I added in typical comments that I would put in red in the middle of a project. So to give you an idea how long these projects should be, a pre preparing a pre-sub meeting should take me no more than a week. I often will say a month to a client, but a week is how long it takes. I can do it in a day, no problem. In fact, one of my employees, she's so fast at it, half a day, without any trouble. She was bragging the other day she can do it in an hour. I think she probably could if you gave her everything she needed. So 
It doesn't take long to create these, but the hardest document for everybody seems to be the device description. My template is free, use it, make it your own, do the device description early. So that's important. Probably the number two document that's really important here uh, for the client to provide if you're working with a consultant is the labeling. Everybody likes to leave this to the end of the 510K project, but I like to include it in the pre-sub meeting it's a draft, a draft IFU, a draft label, because these have indications and they tell the FDA how you're gonna use the device to give them much more information than the device description about the, how the device works, and you make sure all your labeling meets the FDA requirements. So I like to include the draft labeling in the submission. You don't have to, it didn't say anywhere that we had to, but I like to do that. It also, I hate waiting for the marketing people at the 11th hour on a 510K submission. So if I get the marketing people working on the IFU and the label during the pre-sub, they're probably about three, four months early. So not a nice position to be in. So get the labeling in early. And then the third document I need is the testing plan. And a lot of times um, the, the client is working on the testing plan with me. I can do most of this myself, the testing plan. But if the client is doing a clinical study, they probably have somebody that they're working with that's designing the clinical study. So I may be editing it, I might be making comments on it, but the, the client's probably gonna have some input there. So uh, this particular one, I use blue to color code. It needs a signature, but it's done otherwise. It says it requires signature over here. Yellow means it's in progress. Well, this one says in progress, and I just update this as I keep on changing the colors and the status. Red means doesn't exist yet. So this one, we're waiting for content from the client. So what do I need? A paragraph telling them about the development status of the project. Um, down here, I'm looking for the performance testing plan. So it says to, to be done by MDA, Medical Device Academy. Uh, waiting for a draft of a clinical study. Um, I submitted specific questions that I'm recommending the client ask. The client will come back with additional questions for rewording of mine and we expect to update it when we get this clinical protocol. I might be waiting for dates from the client. I suggest, you know, this is when the 70 to 75 days is, what's your availability those five days? And I might have even said, this is when I'm not available in those five days. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how I use the table of contents as a project management tool. Then when I submit, I eliminate all the color coding and I eliminate all the red. Uh, this is gonna be all filled in with number of pages. As I said before, the, the device description, number one thing for the client to start working on, draft labeling in IFU, and the testing plan. And this would include clinical summary, uh, clinical study report. Proposed test plan details. So the things that you wanna have in a test plan, the objective and purpose of the test, explanation of the sample size, statistical methods, summary of the test methodology, particularly if you're not using a recognized standard, you're gonna to want to uh, actually include a copy of that protocol maybe. But if you're doing a standardized test that there's a recognized standards for, say what the recognized standard is, you are not required to submit form 36, uh, 3654, which is the Declaration of Conformity. You're not required to give them the list of all the harmonized standards or recognized standards for a pre-sub. You can if you wish, but I usually don't bother filling it out for the pre-subs. Um, I can say, here's my testing plan, and I want feedback from the FDA on the testing plan. And then we'll have an explanation of study endpoints. So this is post test plan. What are going to be the endpoints for testing? And what are going to be the acceptance criteria? So these are the basic things we want in our test plan, whether it's an official recognized standard or it's something we've developed in-house. Uh, the FDA asks you not to include test results and data. If you have already done the test, why are you asking questions about what testing you should do? Now, if we're having a pre-IDE meeting, and that's the purpose of the pre-sub, then you probably want to have some preliminary animal data. And you might even have a, a first in human study, and that's what you're presenting to the FDA to uh, get their feedback before you go ahead and design your final clinical study design for the pivotal study. That would make some sense. But if you're doing a 510K submission, you're probably not going to have an IDE submission, and you probably don't have any formal clinical data, and you probably haven't done all your verification testing yet. 
So these are, if you already have the testing, just submit your 510K. So this is, I said before, I thought I already had this in there. I do. So requesting in-person or teleconference. Uh, some people call it. You should give the FDA three dates or more uh, of when you prefer between 70 and 75 days from the date of request. You can certainly make it a little bit earlier than that, but 60 days is the earliest that you're supposed to pay. Um, you want to plan who the attendees are going to be. So you might say the following attendees will be there. Um, this is their titles. You don't have to define that. But if you're going to do a face-to-face -face meeting, you're going to have to give the titles, the names of the people, and indicate their citizenship because there's security uh, requirements to get the people into the building. The FDA prefers not to have the face-to-face -face meetings because it's extra work for them. They have to go to another building from where they normally work. So there's the transit time to there and the transit time back. They have to reserve the room. They can't do it remotely. So if they're, it's harder to get more people present for the meeting, plus they have to go through the security. So there's a lot of reasons why you don't want to do an in-person meeting. Um, you also have to ask for audiovisual equipment, a projector, things that you're going to need for that, that teleconference. I'm sorry, the face-to-face -face meeting. There's also the cost of physically traveling there. So it's time and money and a lot of resources. It's not preferred. When have I found it to be valuable? When a company is doing a clinical study and they're going to have their, their head of clinical research there at the meeting that helped write the clinical study protocol and want to discuss the finer points of the clinical study design, and there's a lot of questions about the clinical study design, I can see the interactive discussion will go more smoothly face-to-face. -face. So that would be a great time to do a face-to-face. I've already had a face-to-face -face meeting you're doing a follow-up you can probably do it by teleconference and it's not going to impress the FDA more by you physically being there a lot of companies feel it's important for their first 510k they have to do a face-to-face -to, -face to, to introduce themselves to the FDA and they have the CEO come from the CFO and the vice president of marketing and blah 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 you don't need to do that it doesn't really impress the FDA it just takes more resources and now we spend more time introducing all these people instead of getting to the point of the meeting, which is asking your questions. So, three of meeting questions. One of your questions that you might ask are, a justification for no carcinogenicity test, is that acceptable? Um, oftentimes, well, in particular with uh, biocompatibility, they're actually changing the standard. They're rewriting a draft that's already available for download. They are changing it from being, here's the standard test that we expect, to be asked for physical and or chemical characterization and all the other tests are optional based on your biological evaluation. So changing completely the way they're approaching it in a lot of, probably 80% of your submission for implants, they're getting out of these carcinogenicity and genotoxicity tests because they're doing chemical characterization instead in, in doing a biological evaluation report showing why those tests aren't necessary based on that chemical characterization. Well, if that's your plan, you need to submit a biological evaluation plan or BEP as part of your pre-sub. So now, yes, it's not required you do a pre-sub, but if you want the FDA to agree to your biological or biocompatibility testing plan, that BEP, you probably ought to submit it ahead of time in a pre-sub. And if you want to get out of certain tests, so there are certain tests now that we can do in vitro instead of in doing in vivo animal testing. If you want to save some animals, you have to submit that protocol to the FDA in advance as part of the So that just on biological testing alone, there's a lot of biocompatibility tests we're getting out of with these pre meetings. If you are trying to come up with a justification for why you don't have to do some of the EMC testing, because and barely emits any power and because of the way it's going to be used in the environment of use, you might be able to get out of some of that EMC testing. If you're asking specific questions about the software, or cybersecurity, uh, what, what kind of level of traceability the FDA wants, uh, is it a moderate level of concern or is it a minor level of concern? Do you always think it's minor? The FDA always think it's moderate. These are all great questions for You might want to talk about your human factor study design. You might actually submit an outline of that study to them. If you want to do a study on human factors outside the U.S., which is almost impossible, you need a pre-sub. They almost never allow that. Almost all the human factors are 
are done inside the U.S. because the experiences of people outside the U.S. are quite different. Even getting down to which direction does the light, uh, light switch go, up or down? And then you might also ask specific questions about your predicate. Although you can't ask the FDA, what predicate should I choose, or is this predicate okay, what you can say, is there any problem with this predicate? For instance, is this product a legally marketed device? I don't see it registered or listed anywhere. The company appears to have gone out of business. Can I still use this predicate? Because I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be a viable predicate, even though the company is out of business. And sometimes the FDA will say yes, that's fine. Or sometimes the FDA will say, no, that's no longer on the market for a reason because the device was dangerous and we forced them to take it off the market and some of that information might, be, might not be public or you couldn't find it. So it's a good question to ask. They can't exactly tell you what predicate to use, but they can give you some feedback when that predicate is not okay. If you have an IVD submission, there are different things that you might be asking. A lot of these IVD tests are getting more complex. They're, asked, they're trying to look for multiple things at the same time. Multiplexing devices, they're using new technology, uh, visual systems, uh, computer recognizing system, things that are on your cell phone now. So all these different methods that people are coming up with, they're really changing the way IV the devices work and in the interface. So therefore you might have some specific questions with the FDA uh, related to your clinical study design, interference, uh, testing that needs to be done. You might present some preliminary test data that you've gathered. Um, in bench testing, uh, you might have gathered some specimens and done some preliminary testing, but before you do your full-blown uh, clinical study with specimens, you want to get some feedback from the FDA on the design of the study. So there's a lot of things you might ask for an IVD product. Uh, when you prepare a, a pre-sub, make sure you do your homework. Yes, the purpose of the meeting is to ask questions, but not dumb questions. Only questions that are dumb, as far as the FDA is concerned, is questions that were answered in the guidance documents that they published. So even though everybody else is nice and says there's no such thing as a dumb question, that's what teachers tell you. That's what I tell you during a, a training session. There's no such thing as a dumb question. The FDA feels differently. The dumb questions are questions we already answered in the pre-sub. I mean, answered in the guidance document. So read the guidance document. So make sure you do your homework first and read all the guidance documents. Um, make sure you submit your pre-sub very early and um, include a proposed agenda, not necessarily with the pre-sub, but before you actually have the pre-sub, make sure they get your agenda. Um, practice your questions and responses. Do some role playing. I, I go to Toastmasters meetings for fun, and I like to present. And I'll spend a day preparing for a seven-minute presentation yet I'll find a CEO of a company won't even go through a rough, dry run of their presentation. They're gonna talk for an hour in front of the FDA. That's not okay. You need to come prepared. Um, you wanna focus on which questions are most important. Which questions are gonna require you to retest? Which things are gonna delay your submission? Ask those questions first. Ask the ones that are gonna impact whether you get a non-substantial equivalence letter, not the ones that oh, I need to provide a justification, or I might have to clarify something or do a very quick test that's very cheap and, and fast. Those are the questions you can leave for the end, and you might not get to them. Um, make sure you bring the right people to the meeting, not physically, but virtually. And what's really great about a teleconference is if you say something stupid or you're going down a path that you really shouldn't be going to because you like to hear yourself talk, somebody in the room can kick you underneath the table and the FDA won't know about it because you're at a teleconference. Um, make sure that if you are going to do an on-site meeting, you show up at least 30 minutes early. Do not be late, don't worry. Keep in mind, this is a government location. You're gonna have security and you're gonna have parking issues. Half hour to the room or the, the waiting area before the room, not a half an hour to get onto the property and then. 20 minutes to get through security and uh, another 20 minutes to find the building. And, yeah, it takes a while to get in the building and get through all the security, show up early. And make sure you have your ID. If you're international, you should bring your passport with you. And 
um, have a dedicated scribe, whether you're doing a teleconference or you're in person, a person that will not talk but will take a lot of notes. The only talking you should be doing is asking you to repeat some information that you didn't write fast enough for. You want a scribe, somebody that's great at taking notes, 130 words a minute if they're typing. If you're doing a clinical study, agreement on study size, never ask the FDA on how many patients. The answer they give you will be useless. And for those of you that think that the clinical study has to be 100 patients or it needs to be 300 patients, they're wrong. It depends on what you're trying to study. If you're trying to design a stroke study, you might have 600 patients, maybe more. If you're trying to design a cardiovascular study, a stenting study, you might have over 1,000 patients. If you're designing an aesthetic study to look at uh, how, you know, will this device reduce the number of wrinkles that I have? It's not going to be that big because we're really focusing on safety issues more than anything else. So they're not looking for that large of a study. Uh, so it really depends on what you're studying and how you're going to study it. And you really want statistics to be backing it up. Um, and you can always suggest a study design and you can suggest it as a clinical synopsis or an outline, or a draft, or, re, or bring up an example of another study that's similar and talk about things that you'd like to do slightly different. And then the FDA often asks you as a supplement to submit a formal final clinical study design so they can comment on that before you actually execute the study, especially if it's gonna go for an IDE approval. What not to do in the pre -sub. This is directly from the FDA guidance document, so do not do these things. They've already said, please don't do these. So if you're looking for jurisdiction, is it CEPR, CEDAR, or uh, CDRH? Ask for a request for de designation. They actually have a new draft at guidance document that just came out on that on how to do it, by the way. Uh, if you're asking for classification, what classification it is? You should have gotten a consultant involved. You should have done your homework. And if you still didn't have the answer, you should have done a 513G. That's not the purpose of a precept. So you should already know what the classification is. Um, do not ask questions that can be directed to the reviewer. So if you're in the middle of the submission and this is a very simple question that you're asking the reviewer, you should be doing a pre-sub for that. Um, th that's not really needed. Uh, do, and if, if you're trying to ask questions that can only be answered during a review, then you have to wait till you submit your 510K. They can't give you a decision during a pre-sub. And tell you whether your data is okay. They can ask, they can answer questions about the design and how you're going to get the data. They can't answer a question on the data itself. Um, and if you already do your testing, uh, this is kind of a gray area. I, I said originally, if you already did your testing, don't bother with a pre-sub, but testing can take 12 weeks. And it, it might only take you eight weeks to get the pre-sub. And your question might be about something that's going to be at the very end of the testing, or you might be doing your testing in stages. I'm doing EMC testing first and then electrical safety. I'm going to ask a question about electrical safety, so I'm going to ask it now. I'm into the middle of EMC testing, but I'm going to ask my question all the That makes some sense. But if you've already done the testing on EMC and you want to ask a question about EMC testing, that probably doesn't make any sense. Um, Responding to written feedback. So number one, your option is you can cancel the meeting. They answered all your questions, no further questions. Number two, I want to clarify some questions. I have no further questions about item number one, two, or three, but number four, I still have a question. That's fine, and you can still keep the meeting, but it'll probably be shorter. Now that they've done a great job of answering all your questions. But try to keep the meeting as short as possible, and they will thank you for finishing early. Everybody likes to comment on the non-binding feedback. I probably emphasize this too much of the past. Yes, the feedback from the FDA is non-binding. It's also non-binding both ways. So if you change something in your product or device from what it was in the pre-sub, what you say, what you actually submit is now different. The decisions or discussion points or, or things that they told you before may not apply because you made a change. At the same time, if the FDA suggests you do it this way, you don't have to listen to them. You could do it another way. There may be more than one option, and you may have found a better way 
Uh, there's usually more than one solution to how to address every single testing requirement. Um, you can often provide justifications for just about everything, um, particularly biocompatibility and cleaning validations, things like that. So there is usually more than one way. They'll tell you the most common, correct, or way that they prefer to have it done because it's easy for them to make a decision. But you do not have to do exactly what they say all the time. So it is non-binding. That's what it means, is non-binding. You don't have to do everything they say. Repeating that. So here's a couple of additional points I have. Meeting minutes. So I have a template. I provided you with a template for the meeting minutes. It's a summary, not a transcript. The FDA does not allow you to record the meeting. Now, somebody asked me about that in extenuating circumstances. For instance, if you are deaf, it would probably be allowed for you to record the meeting and to have it transcribed. But the FDA gives you a WebEx and um, the WebEx could be recorded if the FDA chose. The FDA would have a recording of this as well. And if there were a transcript made, the FDA would want a copy of the transcript and you would have to get their permission. I have seen this done back in the old days. I have not seen it done in recent years since 2014 since they released the precept guidance. So, don't count on being able to do any kind of recordings. And you're not supposed to make your own, though I know companies have, um, but it really should only be if you have permission and you're probably not gonna get permission unless you're deaf. So for those of you that are listening to me right now, sorry. If you have employees that can't listen and you're explaining to them what I say, maybe you got a shot. Um, other things in the meeting, re meeting minutes, you want to identify what kind of uh, action items are going to be uh, in response to this meeting. So number one, you're going to provide meeting minutes, but number two, is there going to be a supplement along the way? You might include that, uh, or it might be submitted separately as a supplement. Uh, the meeting minutes is called an amendment, so it'd be A001, and if you're submitting a supplement, it's S001. Supplement would be providing additional information. The meeting minutes is just an amendment to the original precept request. Um, and when you submit the draft meeting minutes, the FDA has 30 days to decide whether they accept it or make edits. You have 15 days to submit your draft. If you disagree with the FDA during the meeting, don't argue, don't spend all your time. You don't have to agree with them. You can come up with another argument. Take some time, think about it, put it in writing. Um, I see a lot of people coming back to the same issue over and over and over again, asking the question a different way. That's not productive, it's a waste of your time and it just pisses them off. Um, summarize your action items at the end, but don't spend 10 minutes on it. You can probably do it in five. Um, but you should summarize it, and number one should be we'll provide many minutes within 15 days. But if you've agreed to provide additional information or summaries to the FDA on a supplement, you should add this, that as an action item. If the FDA is going to get back to you with some information they promised, like, oh, there's this guidance document that we can't remember the name of right now or the number, they can provide that guidance document to you or a link for downloading it. So that would be helpful. Sometimes there's a draft one that they're going to make available to you that's not published yet that would be really helpful. Maybe there's a form they want you to fill out. So those are important things you sometimes have as action items that the FDA is gonna provide. And then one of my favorite questions is, are there any risks to having a pre-sub meeting? Well, yes. Um, if your company is illegally selling the product and you have a pre-sub meeting, um, that's probably gonna get you a letter that says, please stop selling this product until you submit your 510K. Um, the best thing to do is submit a 510K as quickly as possible and deal with their questions as part of the review process rather than spending another 60 to 75 days waiting for a pre sale um, You just don't have any time to waste. You need to get this done as quickly as possible. So yeah, I, that's about the only time I can think of an advantage to having a pre sub or not having a pre-sub meeting. There's a risk there of having a pre-sub all of eyes that, hey, uh, we already have this product on the market and we want to know how to submit a 510K for it. Um, Beyond that, I really can't think of any benefits to not having a meeting. I, I, I had some ideas in the past and almost every single one of those has been debunked. So I am 100% on board with doing pre-subs across the board. Not all my clients uh, take my advice, 
but um, almost every single one of them has been told by the FDA, um, we recommend you have a precept to address this question or this deficiency in your submission. So experience has told us we wish we had done a precept. Um, there was one person that asked for um, what is the status of the recent guidance document, but they didn't tell me which guidance document they were asking about. Guidance documents for the uh, FDA pre-sub process were, was already released in September of last year. So I'll, these are actually all hyperlinks if you look at the actual draft. I'm sorry, the actual slide deck. So here's the uh, request for feedback pre-sub program. There's one on user fees and refunds. There's one on the FDA review clock and goals, responding to deficiencies, um, when to submit a, one for a device modification, when to submit one for a software modification. So that's just the recent one since like uh, middle of last year. There are many more before that are related to 5 So I think there's three or four just related just to software. There's one for software, there's one for cybersecurity, there's one for post-market surveillance of cybersecurity, there's one for EMC testing, there's one for back compatibility, there's one for human factors. And that's just the quick ones off the top of my head. So there are a ton of guidance documents and there is a search tool. If you type in to Google, the world's greatest search engine, uh, FDA guidance documents, it'll give you a link to go search for your guidance documents. So you can search for the word and it gives you both drafts and final guidances. So you should always keep up with that. And there's actually a place where they list the most recent ones by date. So keep an eye on that. They even televise, these are the ones we're gonna plan A list, B list for next year. So we already know which ones they're working on for the following year, uh, so that's very helpful. That brings us to the Q&A. So I, I still have people on mute. I have at least nine questions in the chat. Going through these questions in the chat here. Uh, I had already answered the question about recording, so I think we're all set there. Um, so the person asked, uh, we are eventually interested in learning who should or shouldn't go for an IDE uh, as opposed to a pre-sub right away. Well, if you've already done a clinical study before um, and submitted it to the FDA and you're making a modification to that and you're an experienced veteran of doing clinical studies, yeah, you, should, you could probably go ahead and just submit your IDE. But because the IDE review process takes so long, I think the same kind of the rules that I have for 510Ks would probably apply. Unless you're ready to submit that ID approval within the next week or two, a pre-sub is a really good idea. And if you happen to have the ID ready before you actually have the pre-sub meeting, go ahead and submit it. But because the ID approval takes a while, a pre-sub is a really good idea to make sure that approval process goes really smoothly. And it's an opportunity for you to get to know the people in a, at least a teleconference or face-to-face -face, um, get their feedback and get to know who they are. Now, prefer, do I prefer in-person pre-subs or teleconference for pre-subs? It really comes down to if we're talking about a clinical study, with clinical studies, you typically have an expert in the field that has clinical experience that's going to be in the room in a pre-sub. Um, you might actually know that person personally in which case you really don't need to build a relationship with them. But if you're doing a clinical study and you want to get to know that person there and you have very, you expect an, a, a back and forth discussion about the details of the clinical study, they might actually encourage you to come in. But I've seen a lot of that done just over teleconference and it's a lot more efficient and better use of your resources. So I'm going to stick with my 99% of the time it's better off doing a teleconference. Um, at this time, webinar works for me, but in the future, I'd like to attend in person. Um, yeah, we'd all love to go see the FDA and see how it works inside. Um, if you can, that's great. I personally have never been there. I've sent one of my employees, and I've worked with a lot of people that have gone to the meetings. Um, but, you know, the amount of time, I, I know from as a consultant, every time I get in my car and drive somewhere, every time I get out of the plane, I have been far less productive than if I stayed at home. So I highly recommend um, having the teleconferences and that is what the FDA prefers. So unless you're a clinical expert and you're going to discuss a clinical study design in preparation for an ID, probably very little value. Now, if you were doing a demonstration of a very simple device and you didn't think you could do it as a video, 
you know, think about this. What things could you possibly demonstrate that you can't do as a video? Just about nothing. But if you can think of the example and the only way you could demonstrate is in person, go ahead, bring it in person. But keep in mind, you gotta be able to get it through security. Uh, somebody said, what, what determines significant risk? The FDA. You might think it's non-significant risk. The FDA may think differently. They do have a guidance document out there for IRBs to help them make the decision on whether it's significant risk or not. But I believe it says in that guidance document, when in doubt, contact the FDA or defer to the FDA. That's one of the things that you would ask in a pre-sub. I have been in the middle of a submission. They've said, sorry, one of the deficiencies in your submission is you don't have this clinical data. Why? Because the client didn't do a pre-sub. And they said, sorry, we can't answer that question whether it's significant risk. You'll have to do a pre-sub. So I'm in the middle of a submission. We didn't do a pre-sub. And they're saying the only way I can answer your question is whether it will require an ID or not is if you have a pre-sub. So we have to withdraw the submission, request a pre-sub to ask the question if it needs to be an IRB approval or not. So do a pre-sub and ask that question. It's the only place they can answer whether it's a significant risk or not. Now, you can present your argument for it, but the FDA makes the decision. And they actually have a definition of what is significant risk or not. So you can follow their definition and follow their guidance, but uh, I find a lot of people uh, make the decision based on what they want to hear instead of what the FDA guidance really says. Are the FDA published metrics to show submitting a pre-sub results in reduced 510k clearance time? No, there's nothing like out, that out there. Um, it's a great idea. Um, maybe the FDA is thinking about producing that in the future, but I don't see it happening. Um, I would say, you know, the, the number one way you can get your cycle times reduced is the third party submissions, but that only covers a handful of devices that are eligible for third party reviews. They've expanded that a bit. And there's still a lot of devices that aren't eligible. So I think it reduces your testing time. I think it reduces the number of delays that you have where they're asking for additional information. Um, so I would say it definitely reduces our timelines, but um, there's no metrics out there to prove it. How do we separate definition for design inputs and design specification? Um, well, there's no definition out there for design specification. It's not a, a definition that the FDA has. They have design inputs and design outputs. And that's probably where engineers get confused because they come up with their own terms and they refer to something as a technical specification or a design specification. There is no such thing. Um, so that's your own definition. And I can't really tell you what it is. There are design inputs and design outputs. The design outputs are formal drawings. They'll tell you, you might have a product specification that tells you who you're gonna buy it from and what drawing applies, but that's really a combination of multiple design outputs. And people call them product specifications, but um, there's, not a, there's not an FDA definition of that. The design inputs are going to be things you validate, I'm sorry, verify. The, they would be typically bench testing uh, for the most part. There are some things that might be animal tests. There are some things that might require human testing, but for the 90 plus percent of them, they're going to be bench testing that you're going to be doing uh, for design input verification. Um, if you want to ask more questions of that, about that, I think that's probably outside the scope of this call. And um, it's a favorite debate of people taking my design uh, controls course. Uh, the link for your templates did not work. Um, well, number one, you have to have a Dropbox account, but um, I'd be more than happy to email you that. Um, there's several templates, but I'd be happy to uh, send that to you. So I'm writing down your name and I'll look up your registration and email it to you. Uh, but anybody else that has trouble downloading that, just let me know and I'll email them to you. Uh, the downside of not registering and getting yourself a Dropbox account and copying that link is then you won't be able to go back and get updates. So I would encourage you to get a Dropbox account so you can do that. But um, if uh, you ever want an update uh, or want to know if I have updated something, uh, just email me. Somebody else said, I usually have a regulatory assessment in the pre-sub. Where do I include this? I don't. Um, in the performance assessment section, no. Um, many of my pre-subs are unique devices and part of the pre-sub's goal is to identify if there's an applicable regulatory classification in a proposed predicate. Um, 
I do have quite a few uh, submissions that are pre-subs for a de novo application. So I do have a slightly different format that I use for de novo applications. So in those particular cases, I'm not really going to be referring to a predicate. Instead, I'm going to be explaining why I believe it's a de novo application. And I'm going to be proposing indication for use and intended use that are different from anything out there. So there's actually a document you're supposed to prepare, which is your, um, the work that you've done to uh, search for a possible predicate or possible product classification for your device which is a subset of what your regulatory assessment is. And so I would include that for a de novo application. But for a 510K, I just say, this is what I have identified as a potential predicate. Um, do you see a problem with this potential predicate? For instance, you know, is this a legally marketed device and is there a problem with it? Um, but for the most part, I don't include, include regulatory submissions in my precepts or in my 510Ks, and I've never been asked for it from the FDA. I've also never even been asked for it from the um, notified bodies, and I used to work for a notified body. Um, I know companies have them all the time, but you know, I, I actually prepare them for companies, but it's part of your design plan that helps you determine what your design inputs are, and it's not really part of your regulatory submission. So it, it, it's a document I create very early in the process before I do a pre-sub, and I might have questions about some of the points in there, but I don't actually present that document to the FDA. Um, be happy to answer more questions about that for you. Just email me. Um, can we ask about accessory classification? Um, uh, um, the FDA is supposed to be doing that in the 513G. Uh, so you could submit that. You could also ask a consultant to do the assessment for you and try to determine what the accessory would be classified. Um, the FDA might have already determined in the guidance document what it is. But uh, if the accessory is required to use the device, it will normally be included in the submission. If the accessory already has a 510K, then you would list that in the device description. And so you can see that in my template for device descriptions. Um, and the FDA has a new guidance document on interoperability that you might want to read that's related to this topic. Uh, how do we mention a related accessory with a predicate? Um, well, if the predicate uses a similar uh, accessory, then that's how you would do it. You would, in the substantial equivalence comparison, which is not part of your precept. Um, and if you're going to be submitting the accessory um, in your submission, you would probably, well, you definitely would include that in your device description. So typically where I'm gonna talk about accessories uh, would be in the device description. And if I had a question about that, I would probably ask it in, I would say, I would refer to my device description. I would say, in the device description, we list the following accessories. Uh, we provided the K numbers for the items that are already cleared. Uh, if it's not, if it's a class one accessory, then it doesn't require clearance. Then you, sometimes I'll, I'll list similar devices. So uh, my, any of these devices that are in this product classification would probably apply. And I, I would give an example of the most popular one that, that people use. Uh, but if you had a question about that, you could ask and refer to your device description. Um, the links to templates are not working, so I already answered that question. Um, how, and I'll also write down that person's name. So I, um, and I, I double checked that link, so I, I'm, I'm hoping the issue is that people uh, just don't have a Dropbox account. But um, sometimes different browsers do funny things. Uh, sometimes your company prevents you from doing it too with uh, blocking certain access to websites. How does one know if a clinical study is even necessary, such as for a new type of wheelchair? Uh, well, for even with new types of wheelchairs out there, in, uh, I think this particular person needs to contact me directly because I think I know what device they're working on. Um, but if you have a new type of wheelchair that is covered by the existing guidance documents for wheelchairs or the standards out there for wheelchairs, um, then you would ask, uh, this is one of the technological differences of our wheelchair versus what other wheelchairs are, and this is how we're proposing to address it in our uh, performance testing plan. Is this acceptable? And you would ask for feedback from the FDA on how you plan on addressing that unique technological difference. But in theory, the indication for the wheelchair is the same as any other wheelchair. 
Um, if the indication is quite different, you might be looking at a de novo submission. Uh, but I, I'm thinking that there is probably an indication out there for your device and that fits very nicely. And what we're really talking about is technological differences. And the, the next question in the substantial equivalence uh, flowchart is, does, do the technological characteristics introduce new risks? And if they do, then it's not substantial equivalent and it's going to be a de novo. So that's an important point that you're gonna discuss with the FDA. You're gonna present why you think the technological differences do not present a new risk that you're gonna to have to submit a de novo for because you don't wanna pay the 25 grand for a de novo when you can submit um, uh, simply like 2,500 for a 510K. So I highly recommend you talk to me a little bit more about that particular item. Um, uh, the next person said, thank you. Uh, great talk. So. Thank you very much. Um, where can I find the slide deck for this webinar? I email it to everybody, but um, I will look up your name here and I will send you a copy of it by email because you probably didn't uh, confirm the registration. So I'm writing that name down. Um, even I couldn't see any documents. So this is another person. Are we going to receive a recording? Yes, you are. As soon as I'm done, I'll start compiling it and it'll take about a half hour to an hour. It's so probably after I get back from dinner. Uh, is a de novo application more work, more difficult? If so, is a positive result sweeter? <laughs> um, uh, you might find it more satisfying, but it costs more and takes longer. So I would say uh, you would prefer not to have a de novo. Now, Strategically, if you can, if you have deep pockets and want to do a clinical study as a barrier to entry for other companies that come after you, you would want a de novo application and you would want to specify in the special controls that we want a clinical study because then all your competitors that come after you also have to do a clinical study. So it keeps the mom and pop startups out of the business and only the companies with deep pockets can do the clinical studies and therefore it'll kill competition. Uh, it gives you some, somewhat of a monopoly. So from that perspective, you definitely want a de novo, but um, since most people don't have the money for a clinical study, then you probably don't. Now, if you have NIH funding, maybe you want to do a clinical study. Um, so that, that's a more of a strategic discussion, and I think this is a person that's asked another couple other questions, um, and I think they need to talk to me a little bit more for their specific issue. Um, but de novos in general, um, the actual application is not significantly more work. I use a very similar format. The FDA encourages that. There are a few documents that are substituted. Uh, I would say probably the big difference between the two is instead of, substan of substantial equivalence comparison, instead I'm providing a benefit risk analysis. And so the FDA's guidance on risk benefit analysis or benefit risk analysis is what I follow, and I prepare that document. And so that's the but I think it's actually easier to write that document for me than it is to write the substantial equivalence one. So um, I don't see it being a lot more work, but it definitely takes the FDA longer to review it and cost you more. It used to be free, it's no longer. Uh, somebody said, enjoyed the webinar and learned some new stuff as well. We'll try to ask my boss if it's something we can do sooner than later. So yes, um, I mean, to get me to help you do it, yes, it costs some money, two grand, um, but at the same time, I've given you a lot of information here. I've given you my free templates. There are a bunch of guidance documents on it, and the FDA charges nothing for it. And you can always do a second one if you need to. So uh, I would encourage you to do it sooner, not later. Um, I'm also offering to anybody that's still listening, um, we're also offering a, a, a 510K workshop uh, for two days in Las Vegas. It's on the 21st and 22nd. So you're going to get access not only to my pre-sub templates, you get access to all my 510K templates, my de novo templates, my folders, access to seven different consultants that are expertise that have expertise in different areas like software validation, electrical safety, human factors, clinical studies, biocompatibility, uh, design controls, and 510K submissions. So if you're interested in that, it's only $9.95, and if you're sending more than one person for your company, there's a 20% discount for the other people. Um, and um, it's in Vegas.
where it's guaranteed to be sunny and warm. For those of you in Minnesota or Vermont, where I live. A uh, person said, I enjoyed a lot, uh, learn new things. Can we get complete slides? Yes, you will get a copy of my complete slides. Uh, you should have already gotten them. So I will see if this person uh, but you should have gotten an email with my slide deck and you will get it as part of the uh, email with the links to download the recording. Uh, thank you. Learned a lot of new things. Great. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Links work for me without using Dropbox. Okay. Somebody else was able to get it to work, so there must be some sort of a browser problem for somebody, and I'm not sure what it is. So I would suggest try the link I gave for downloading the templates from another device. Uh, after an RTA and a recommendation from the inspector to have a pre-sub, I suppose there's no discussion about to have one. Um, well, you don't necessarily have to have a pre-sub. Um, you may be able to have somebody like myself uh, help you answer the questions. We may have, like, sometimes the, comp the FDA will ask you to have a pre-sub to answer some of your questions, but it's because they can't give you advice in the deficiency letter on how to address this. Um, so a lot of these questions we might be able to already answer for you because we've been through enough pre-sub meetings and read enough guidance documents and done enough submissions. We know how to address that and what your options are. Uh, we may, you know, just, it's hard to beat experience when you've done tons of submissions. But um, for certain things, like if I want to know whether this is a, um, going to be a significant risk or non-significant risk, and I have to provide clinical data, and there's no way around it, yeah, you're stuck with a pre-sub, and you're probably going to have to withdraw your submission. So sometimes you're right, but I would have to see your RT later to give you an answer on that. But um, it's a quick review, usually, for, to review one of those and tell you uh, yes or no. Uh, thank you very much. Can you provide us some examples of technical questions you may ask during a pre-sub? Oh, everybody wants that. Hmm. Okay, so here's what I will try to do because I think even my own employees are probably like this. I will try to expand on my existing basically blank template for questions to ask and I will try to come up with some examples. So examples or uh, technical questions for pre-sub. Um, so I will try to come up with some and maybe uh, one well, of my employees can also help me out with that. Um, somebody says thanks. Okay, so I think we are at the end of this. Um, we are already uh, 23 minutes over my target here, so it's going to be a long recording. Um, I'm, I thought I would quickly jump over to emails here on my phone and see what I got there. Uh, somebody said thank you very much and asked for the slide deck. So uh, I already have their name down. So I will definitely get them that. And I think that's it. I don't see any others. Okay. Uh, oh, here's here's some other questions. Oh, there's a whole a whole bunch of emails. Okay, so there are like six different emails. <laughs> Uh, I think this is probably too much for me to cover right now, so I'm going to respond to these individually. Um, and also, in my emails, I think I've given people a Calendly link. There's also one on my contact us page, so you can schedule Calendly links or schedule uh, meetings with me. It's also on this last slide. It says uh, Calendly.com, 13:45 start, 15 minutes. So if you change that 13, uh, 15 minutes to 30 minutes or 60 minutes, you can schedule longer meetings. Um, the first half hour for a new client is free. Uh, and then after that, I start charging. And I warn you in, in advance that, OK, this is beyond the scope of what we can do for free. But here's my hourly rate, 250 per hour. And we can talk. Um, thank you very much, everybody. I really enjoyed it. You, some great questions today. And I will uh, follow up with a recording for everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.